In this video, it might be a little bit dense to kind of go through, but we're going to talk about glycogen synthesis. What is glycogen synthesis? Glycogen synthesis is making glycogen from glucose. So we're basically, we're storing glucose. So when would, we, when would we want glycogen synthesis to occur? When would we want to store glucose? Well, when we have high concentrations of glucose, right, that would be a good time if, because if we have too much of it, we might want to store it. Or higher levels of ATP. Essentially, what that is, is during high energy, uh, um, during high energy states. During high energy states. That's when we want to store the energy. If we have too much energy around, let's store it. Let's, let's take all this glucose and store it somewhere. So if you recall, glucose 6-phosphate from which pathway this was? This was, this was actually from glycolysis, right? If we have glucose 6-phosphate and we add this enzyme phosphoglucomutase, what this enzyme does is it isomerizes glucose 6-phosphate and just moves this phosphate group over to the one the, the one carbon's OH group and turns it into glucose 1-phosphate. This is needed for glycogen synthesis, which is why I actually just mentioned it here. So, how is it needed? Essentially, this glucose 1-phosphate needs to be activated before we can even actually put it into a, a, a glycogen chain. So before we can make glycosidic bonds with this G1P, we need to activate it. So this, this reaction that I'm about to discuss here is, is about the activation of glucose 1-phosphate. So glucose 1-phosphate comes along and this thing called uridine triphosphate, which is a pyrimidine nucleotide, comes in. And then what we have happen is this, uh, this uridine and this, phos this first phosphate group here end up attaching to this phosphate on the G1P. So what we get is this uridine and we have these two phosphates and then we have glucose. So what we call this thing is UDP, which is right here, UDP diphosphate glucose or UDPG. What do we have left over is just these two phosphate groups here. Those two phosphate groups here exist as this thing here, which is called a pyrophosphate, inorganic pyrophosphate. So this inorganic pyrophosphate can be hydrolyzed into two individual inorganic phosphate groups and that actually drives this reaction forward. So the energetics here, uh, we have G1P and UTP to form UDPG and this pyrophosphate. That's actually a, um, um, a reaction that's at equilibrium. It's isoenergetic. Whereas the, the pyrophosphate being hydrolyzed into the two, two inorganic phosphate groups has a negative free energy, which means it's a sp spontaneous process and therefore is exergonic, right, exergonic or spontaneous, right, so this powers the production of UDPG. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I, reason, I put a pink star here over the hydrolysis of this pyrophosphate, um, and the reason why is because it's very common in, in metabolic processes for a pyrophosphate hydrolysis to power or drive a particular reaction, so I kind of wanted to give you guys a heads up for that. Um, so, but why did we do this? Why is this whole, why did we, why did we do this? Why did we, why wouldn't we just add this G1P to a carbon or to a glycogen chain, excuse me? The reason why is because UDP, this, having this UDP on here, instead of just this phosphate, this UDP is a better leaving group than the phosphate group, which brings me to my next point about the enzyme glycogen synthase. So glycogen synthase, quite simply, is the maker of glycogen. It's the thing that makes glycogen. When would it be active? Well, we mentioned earlier that we would want it to be active during high energy states, right? Because glycogen synthase is a storing, storing glucose as glycogen. So we want to only store glucose when we already have plenty of it around, when we have plenty of energy, high energy states. Um, so what glycogen synthase does, it actually catalyzes a very particular reaction. The reaction that it catalyzes is it adds a glucose unit in the form of UDPG, which we just created above, um, or just a moment ago, to an existing glycogen chain. So it makes a glycogen chain one glucose unit longer. So how exactly does it do that? Well, let's think about this. This is the UDPG that we just created here, this glucose with this uridine diphosphate, UDP glucose. Now this here is what I've drawn here is a glycogen chain that's n residues in length. I've only drawn two residues here because I didn't want to spend too much time uh, drawing out a bunch of different glucoses. 
But you can imagine that this chain goes on further and further and further, which is actually why I drew this OR here. It indicates the continuation of this polymer sort of in this direction to the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happens? What is the reaction that glycogen synthase catalyzes? Well, we want this glucose, right? We want this glucose here to be attached to this glycogen chain at the non-reducing end, which we mentioned in the previous video. So what happens is this OH group here, it acts as a nucleophile to attack this carbon, right? This is a nucleophilic attack. And then what happens is the electrons from this bond attack onto the phosphate, and then UDP hops off. So what ends up happening is we form a covalent bond between between this, this glucose and this uh, glucose here from the glycogen chain. <clears throat> Excuse me again, I'm sorry about that. This UDP hops off. It's, 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 it's free. It's, it's no longer bound. But this glucose here, which I've indicated in yellow, has been attached to the existing chain, which was already in white. So this here is, of course, a particular glycosidic linkage. It is an alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage. So that's what glyco glycogen synthase actually does, is it forms these alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Um, so now this glycogen chain is N plus 1 residues in length. It's one glucose longer than it was before. So um, I mentioned that uridine diphosphate is a better leaving group than, than the 1-phosphate the phosphate group. And so it allows this reaction to, to happen more readily which is why we even attach the uridine diphosphate in the first place. So hopefully that makes sense there. So glycogen synthase, this is how it actually adds uh, another glucose molecule to an existing glycogen chain. Now, uh, as, a, as a brief sort of mention, um, we mentioned earlier that we... So basically what happens, actually, um, <laughs> is once we have these, this UDP, right, um, if we want this reaction to continue, if we want glycogen synthase to actually do this again, catalyze this reaction again, then what we need is we need to activate another glucose 1-phosphate. We need this reaction to happen again so that we can create another UDPG that we can attach to the glycogen chain. Well, in order to do that, we need another UTP, right? So this UDP, right, um, comes together with uh, an ATP, to and basically the ATP gives the UTP its phosphase or the UDP a phosphate. So this U this thing has two phosphate groups. ATP has three phosphate groups. This ATP gives up a phosphate to the UDP to regenerate UTP, and then we're left with an ADP. So the purpose of this is we must regenerate UTP to continue to synthesize glycogen. Right? We need to create more UDPGs, so we need more UTPs around. Right? We need more of these so that we could have this reaction occur again, right? This is a requirement here for that activation step. So a little bit more if you're interested. Uh, glycogen synthase, we just mentioned this, it only adds glucoses to an existing chain, and that existing chain has to be at least at least eight glucoses long. Um, so really, glycogen synthase is involved in the elongation of an existing glycogen chain. Um, how does it begin? Well, that's where glycogenin comes in. So glycogenin, it generates glycogen. So it actually initiates glycogen synthesis. Um, after it initiates glycogen synthesis, then glycogen synthase takes over to elongate. So glycogenin is really just involved in initiation. In addition, in the last video, we talked about how there were branches on glycogen. So there is the, there's this enzyme called the branching enzyme. And what it does is it takes about six residues, six glucose residues at a time from the non-reducing end of an existing chain. And it takes those, those six residues and it attaches them, attaches them um, at branch points um, via alpha-1,4, or excuse me, alpha-1,6 linkages. So that's a sort of um, summary of what goes on with glycogen synthesis. I hope that was helpful. Even if it was a little bit dense, maybe you should go back and pause the video and do whatever you need to do to understand this stuff. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.